Hello everyone, I'm Konstantin Yakushenko and this is Vyacheslav Kabelinsky. Hi there. So we, today we are going to share our experience, tips and tricks on developing and finishing an open world game with Unreal Engine 4. So let's start. Few words about our company first. We work at Frogwars, a studio located in Kyiv, Ukraine, uh, that has been developing games since 2000s. For the last 18 years, we have made 20 games for platforms like Xbox One, PlayStation 4, PC, and, and some older platform no one care about now. Starting from 2012, we switched from in-house engine to Unreal Engine 3 and successfully shipped free game with it. In 2015, we began to use Unreal 4 for our new ambition project, The Sinking City. And this presentation uh, will, it is based on our experience developing this game. And by the way, I wonder how many people here know about The Sinking City? Please raise your hand. Okay, who don't work at Fro who work at Frogos, please <laughs> don't worry. <write. laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, well, for those of you who don't know, there is the basics. The Sinking City is a an open world action investigation game inspired by work Howard Lovecraft and set to be released for PlayStation 4, Xbox One and PC. So I will show you a short, very short gameplay video about the game. So let me see how it how our game looks like and uh, game is finished and currently we are a submission process for PlayStation 4 and Xbox one uh, good luck to us <laughs> so before we start to make an open world game in new engine for engine for us uh, we ask it ourselves how do other game studio make an open world games and how do they do it on Unreal 4 Unfortunately, in 2015, we didn't find any shipped game, shipped open world game with Unreal 4. There was a lot of games, but they all were corridors light. So we had to improvise. At first, we made some basic pillars for the future production. We knew that we want an open world game, uh, which was our first pillar. So it means open city, free travel, no limit for player. So we initially decided that city size won't be less than one square kilometer. And, and to fill such size, we would need a lot of content. So we had to find a way to, we, we, we have to find a proper way to produce it easily. No engine modification. When, well, it's missed. Yeah, no engine modification. Where we're working with Unreal 3, we modified it, it a lot. Uh, in, Integrating a new version on either a minor change log become nearly impossible to do for us. In order to not to fight with all problem alone, we decided to stick with Unreal 4 Evolution. And according to its guidelines, we developed all our tools as plugins. With this approach, we were able to integrate a new version easily. It took us two weeks on average, meaning some of them took two, three days and some other amounts. We started at version 4.09, and we're going to ship the game at version 4.20. Oh. For a game of this scale, our resources were short. A uh, key process had to be automated as much as possible to decrease manual work. Mm. To make an open world game properly, our feature and content must be standardized. Frankly speaking, we have only one place in the game where we are using game, uh, use level blueprint scripting. All other gameplay logic was made using only our tools. 
So next. Okay, so during this presentation, me and Vyacheslav will talk about three things. How we create our city and people who live there, how we create our game story, how we collect information about our game, and how we present it to everyone in the company. Okay, so in order to achieve our pillars, we have created those major tools. Uh, and we will focus on the core feature of the, of the tools that we use, and we think that they are extremely important in open world game development. At least they were for us. First is character editor. Uh, we made it to create hundreds of characters having only three character artists in team. This tool moves the final character creation and iteration from artist to narration designer. Uh, artists create only a set construction of, uh, of set of construction elements. I mean arms, legs, heads, coats, and other. And the designer combine it in a user-friendly environment. Very controlled user-friendly environment. This game has 377 characters, while our previous ship is with 65 in same development time and with the same team size. Next, dialogue editor. Okay, so dialogue in all our previous projects were made by cinematics artist Manory. All dialogues. It could take days to create one dialogue, and after all necessary iteration, it could take a month to finalize it. Uh, for Sinking City, we wanted to have more than 100 dialogues, and we couldn't afford us spending much time of each of them. So, well, we didn't involve the wheel here. Basic concept of our dialogue tools is from Witcher 3 dialogue editor, adapted for our game and Unreal 4. I strongly recommend you to watch this GDC talk. Link is over here. By the way, we are going to share our presentation, so you don't know, don't need, don't need to make a photo. So it will be available. So, yeah. So, uh, city, city and building editor. In order to create a uh, two square kilometer city with five environment artists, we had to create a convenient tool for them. Uh, I will show you a short video about those tools. Here at Frogwares, we are currently working on a brand new project, The Sinking City. It is an open world game and we want to create a vast and diverse map to explore. Our city, Oakmont, will have different districts, many many kilometers of streets and thousands of buildings. Usually it would take a lot of time and efforts to manually place every object on the map. At some point, it would get too cumbersome, so we decided to shake things up a bit. Our software unit developed a very special tool in Unreal Engine 4. With it, we can create those vast and unique areas in just a few hours instead of months. Here is a quick rundown of how it works. First, we prepared hundreds of presets of different types of buildings, each fully customizable. These presets follow specific rules and architectural styles. Rich houses, decaying shacks, landmarks, commercial, destroyed or intact. The combination we can use to build our city are limitless. Then we create a city grid and decide which presets we want to use in our districts. For example, we want a residential area here, industrial over there, and this street is supposed to be flooded. Once we are done with the urban planning, we press a button and watch the magic happen. Our tool will generate the entire city in Unreal Engine 4 by itself. All the meticulous, often frustrating work will be done by the software. And we can modify our city anytime we want, add unique buildings, and even name our streets. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we won't speak a lot about these tools. Uh, our lead tech artist, Alexander Oskin, has already made a presentation uh, about it last year on Real Fest. And we are going to share it with our presentation, so if you're interested, you can check it. He is also present here this year, so in case you have any question, ask me, I will show you who, who is it. <laughs> okay. Okay, now artists had created all the content in the way that was convenient for them. Uh, on the next few slides, I will tell you how we dealt with it. On the screen, you can see the, our first city prototype using, uh, that created using our new tools. It's a general view. Uh, when we start using city editor, we faced the follow following difficulties. First, the city that we created was huge. The whole city was a, a single UMAP file. 
as you know, Unreal maps are binary and you cannot merge it. And it is impossible to want more than one artist to work with one map simultaneously. And the second issue, uh, to have this whole city loaded in the editor consume more than 48 gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> and it takes some time to load. A lot of time. This is why we decided to divide the city into different districts and got certain new map that combined together into one big city. And now each artist could work with a separate part of the city and we didn't need, and we didn't need to upgrade developer's PC. For level modellers, that was a good solution. They were happy. And so, victory? Not yet. Gameplay designers want to load only a small part of the district during playing in editor iterations. And those big levels would be streaming in, out during playing, loading to huge hitches and huge playing in editor start loading times. It also was not good for the console builds. Size of districts was too big to be streamed efficiently and led to out of memory crashes. So, this led us to the following solution. We cut the city districts one more time and now we got a lot of small new maps that we call cells. We tried different sides of the cells and finally we stopped with 95 meters. And it works. It works pretty good uh, for balancing streaming speed and memory consumption, at least for us. On the slide you can see a real screenshot from our out of this showed our whole composition and this approach satisfied both console and playing and editor performance. Okay, ah. <laughs> to support a long view distance and not let the player fall if he is fast in the level streaming, uh, for example, it could happen on console with slow HDD mode on, we generate level load for each cell after cutting. Uh, you can see example here on the slides. Uh, we take all static mesh that are big enough and bake them into one single proxy mesh with reduced polygons and low res textures. Okay, so I will show you the video and from final game and this video was taken from PlayStation 4. There is no sounds. Here uh, we use this tool to check if uh, streaming distance and cell size are good enough. As you can see, when character is running, some cells load to, to memory, red, red color, while others unload green color. And how level loads purple, uh, replaced to the normal cells, and vice versa. These tools help us a lot to find a right number for level streaming and we have to develop it because Unreal 4 doesn't have any way to debug word composition and cook it build. Yes, yes, Epic engineer, Engineers, help us. Uh, yeah, this is how our final city creation pipelines looks like. Uh, we have environment artists that work in their own universe in, with city and building editors. They commit district maps it's those 13 big ones I have mentioned before. And every night when everyone goes to sleep, our CI system runs nightly procedures. And we call them nightly, but honestly, we can run them whenever we want. So, yeah, yeah. So, they are. Convert our procedural mesh to the static mesh. For us, it's roads, roof, some part of the corner buildings. Uh, generate now mesh volumes, sound volume, and other volumes. Uh, cut districts into the cells, generate level load for each of for, for each cell, recalculate reflection for each of, for each map, and generate statistic from editor, and uh, quite a few more. Yeah, result of those procedures are committed to the depot, and everyone can work with a new city on the next days. Uh, yeah. To finalize, this workflow workflow has some pros and cons. The pros are. We keep the freedom on for environment artists. They can do whatever they want in the district levels. And this leads us to the better visual quality of the final city. And also, allow us, optimization team, to control what will be in the build. If we need to remove some actors, we just filter them out when we create the cells. 
We can easily change the cell level size, streaming distance, level load settings. And if we need to, we can process some actors in specific way during level cutting procedure. This, give us, this gave us a huge flexibility when we are optimizing our game. As for the cons, uh, we had one day luck before any city artist work will be available to the rest of the company and present in the build. And we need constantly maintain and improve this pipeline. Okay, so now when you know how we deal with the art in our game, which style will speak about how we create story and collect, pres and collect data from the game. Okay, everyone, let's get straight to it. Uh, next few slides, I'll be telling you about how we did features and story scripting in our game. And a little bit about why have we decided it to do that way. So, our previous titles, I mean Sherlock Holmes uh, Crimes and Punishment and Sherlock Holmes Devil Daughter. They were uh, linear Unreal Engine 3 games. All gameplay features there have been scripted by mission scripters, and programmers only provided a framework for them, created uh, Kismet nodes and such. And here is an example of a simple feature script. Yes, it's quite simple uh, from that games. As you can probably imagine, there are quite a few things that may and did go wrong, like these global variables over there, or the remote events, and uh, this gets especially important during a uh, long production cycle. Here is a not so simple script from Sherlock Holmes Dale's Daughter. And basically what this is, it's uh, one specific location logic level. Uh, now think about what's going to happen if uh, the level scripter in charge of this is going to change during the production. And by the way, the whole picture didn't fit. It goes quite uh, to the right and to the below of this. And another problem that goes right of this is that uh, story flow and single feature script uh, logic, they're all scripted on this layer, on the same one. And it may lead to all sorts of troubles in case of even one small mistake somewhere, because this would lead to a full story block. And uh, also because uh, all the logic scripts are unique between features, uh, usually there is no way for a programmer to test his changes if he do changes some one node or some game system, other than uh, fully retesting the whole game. Thankfully, those old games, they were linear and experienced tester could beat one in less than two hours, well, using slow-mo and other stuff, but still. So thankfully, they were manageable to ship, albeit just barely. So for us, it was obvious that the old ways are a no-go for a not-so-linear open-world project of the thinking city scale. And we've been discussing and analyzing a lot about what have caused uh, uh, all the troubles. And uh, we had to make some probably tough decisions on how features should be designed and used to avoid most of those problems in the new open world. So first thing we did, we decided to completely exclude Kismet, now it's called Blueprint Scripting, for features and game logic. Because, frankly speaking, absence of complex scripting would certainly eliminate most of the issues and problems there. We started to create and use only, <coughs> only what we now call an encapsulated feature. It's a C++ actor or component uh, with a selection of settings uh, for mission designers to choose from to create gameplay situation, but they no longer have direct access to all the internal logic of, of every feature. So this approach probably removed some of their like flexibility and freedom you know, to make 
everything unique to make uh, everything properly. And they can no longer tweak every parameter exposed for them. But on the other hand, they can only use the stuff which programmers and tester teams has gave them to use. Meaning he's no longer able to make a fatal mistake of setting everything up. And uh, also, we now know that feature is either working everywhere or it's broken everywhere. So this gave us possibility to change features and to polish them even months after production has started. It's now also easier and faster to create gameplay scenes, basically because uh, all the features are small cubes from which they can build their stories. It takes a lot less time, it's a lot less error prone. So this approach basically covers uh, one of the problems I described, that, but we still have another one, meaning how do we tie feature and feature together in order to create a gameplay story? And uh, we have answer for that too. So for that, we had created new tool, and we call it narration editor. Besides the main idea of dividing story and feature script, narration editor creation goals were: we wanted to have less bugs by using only the encapsulated. Uh, yeah, it's it. We wanted to create less bugs by only using encapsulated features I have spoke about earlier, because with this new tool, you simply cannot have, uh, cannot use uh, any other unsupported stuff. Obviously, this tool should be easier and simply to use to create new quests. And readability was also important for us. It was designed with readability in mind. And the last one is fast iteration, because the tool should allow us to change things easily and also without breaking everything after a few changes. So, this is how our narration editor tool looks like now. Uh, we created this based on existing functional in Unreal Editor Graph and Unreal Editor Node classes. We thought that uh, any game's plot may be considered as a directed graph, where each story unit, and by that I mean one feature, is a node on this graph. So when some feature is complete, it activates some other ones that lie behind it on the story graph. We call this feature node a lift node, and allowed it to contain exactly one story feature each. On the screen here, you can see a process of adding a new feature on the scene and attaching it to narration graph. As you can see, it's not that hard to do. Most of our story features have an assigned actor somewhere in the game world. And examples of this are Dialogue topic with a connected NPC actor to speak with and do smooth storyline. Or probably some kind of uh, investigation clue object like that cube over there, uh, which player can find, click on it, and discover some kind of lead, etc. And for narration editor, every game story feature with world representation, that is, it's derived from the narration component class. And uh, this class basically knows how to communicate with narration graph and can activate and deactivate its feature exactly when it's needed by the game story. Also, some features have no world representation. For example, cutscene video playing or maybe scripter wants to change the weather inside the world or time of the day, this kind of stuff. And uh, that kind of features, they are activated directly by the graph. So, Narration Graph makes story feature available when all their prerequisites are met. And when a feature is complete by the player, it updates Narration Graph and activates new feature if needed. No checks are made every tick, only once per 
game story state change, so it adds up to the optimization side of this. Our nodes can have any number of input pins. If more than one edge goes into a single pin, for example like this one, then all of these features need to be finished in order for that node to be active. And uh, we can have more than uh, one output pin if the feature that is inside the node supports that. For example, this dialog, it could be finished in uh, two different ways. And uh, only one of them will be fired on the end of dialog, based on what our character or the player decided to say to the NPC there. Also, nodes can be excluded using this red input pin over here, meaning that this node will be deactivated if it was active when it's excluded, or it just won't be activated if its all prerequisites are met. Of course, we also had to introduce a few technical nodes such as start node, finish node, and container node. Currently, you can see an example of this on this slide. So any R graph, it can contain uh, any amount of subgraphs in special container nodes. So what this does for us? This enables simultaneous work of a few mission designers for the whole story, as one narration graph is a single US set file, and therefore it is non-mergeable. And another benefit is that this provides a way for better structuring the story graph by grouping them inside contain containers based on quest, based on some quest part, quest location and stuff. And this is kind of better than the Kismet we had earlier. And every graph contains exactly one start and end node for better readability, but they can have more than one input or output pin. Generation Graph also manages scripting for loading and unloading of logic levels. So any leaf or container node can have a level with some actor on it. This level will be loaded when this node becomes active and it be will be unloaded when the node is no longer active. In this way we can easily set up specific scenes for quests, and we can also guarantee that they will be loaded and unloaded exactly when it is needed by the story. Also, best way to avoid mistakes is to make it obvious to anyone when they are made. With this in mind, we have implemented some basic error checking inside this tool, and you can see almost all of them on this screen. So, we do check if node is properly connected to the game world. It says green field inside this actions on node. We do check is feature inside set up properly. If not, we show a red error sign over there. For example, this dialog topic, it has no dialog topic set up inside. So basically it's an error and we'll show that. We also check does the assigned level exist. It's this green level label text over here. And we also check, uh, do every sub-container graph exist? This is checked on graph load time, because we, frankly speaking, had a few times when mission designer can add a container level, but forget to check in the US set file, which is created during that. And we get a nice pop-up message that, hey, we are missing a subgraph. Please find someone to commit it. Nope. Also, quite accidentally, narration graph turned out to be very convenient during a game runtime. And what you see here is a narration debug tool. And it has started, it was made by programmers for themselves, like in order to see what is really going on when we were developing the tool. But accidentally, other people has seen it. And Soon, it was used by everyone in the company. 
I mean mission designers, feature scripters, mission scripters, testers, and so on. And we even gave the access to that through the outsource localizers so that they can uh, test the stuff they are translating right now. Basically, the tool allows us to do the following things. So right here you can see currently active features. And you can even see the comments, their names, watches, uh, the, all the stuff that is uh, written in by the mission scripter. Here you can manually finish any game feature. If it would have like dial two options, there will be two buttons here. You can choose uh, where you want it. You can easily find a place where the feature is by using that button. If you are a programmer like me and you want to test some stuff but you don't know where it is in the city. We also created buttons to quick start any main or side quest inside our game. And it works as if you are honestly progressed that far. So you start a new game, press somewhere like here, main quest 6, and the graph just wraps up and shows, uh, gets you the, the fastest way to go, go in there and finish and everything, giving you all the experience, all the rewards, uh, opening and closing up, or the basically as if you really honestly finished it that far. Also, we've done quite a neat feature here. We could reset all the logic game state from this to you just the init generation graph, then init it again, and it's as if, as if we have started the new game again, but without the need to reload everything. Using the graph-like uh, graph -like structure of our story, we also have written a few automation tests that use narration graph to check the story for blockers, crushers. And we did that basically by teleporting our runtime automation to every feature and, feature and finishing it. Uh, this way, we always knew that narration graph itself is scripted properly, and every quest is finishable without hand testing the whole game every day. So, by introducing narration graph to isolate story scripting and by making all the features inside our game and encapsulated C++ actors and components, we were able to create more than 50 hours on gameplay. Uh, having only four mission scripted dedicated to that. Also, we actually had quite a few times less bugs, story-related blockers, this kind of stuff, than we had in our previous title, Sherlock Holmes Tales Daughter. And this new title scope was quite bigger than the old one. Another fun part of graph-like story structure is that we got ourselves an easy save load system from this. Because right now we don't have to save uh, game world state and we don't have to save any blueprint state at all. We only save a team map of node name and node state. And when we need to load the game, we just apply that to the narration graph and basically set up everything as if it is in the state uh, of this T-map. This is also quite extendable for future DLCs if we want to make them. Because you can really add any new nodes to the existing graph. And the only pr problem you may take is that you cannot uh, modify existing graphs because Obviously, you will break some save game state for some existing players, but adding new stuff is pretty easy. And it also allows for easy automation. You can check everything you want because you have a story graph and you can use it for fun and profit whenever you want during your game production. Lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about information and how do you know every detail about the game that more than 50 people are making every day? How do you present this knowledge to all of them? And how this can help you in your project? Our own web tools have started from requirement to know two things. We wanted to know the optimization 
status of our game on all platforms. And we wanted to know gameplay and artistic objects usage through our city. And we really wanted this data to be present every morning to reflect our yesterday's changes and progress. And we not really wanted this data to be a huge Excel table on some other stuff that no one really can and will look at. So, with all that in mind, what we now call a big frogware system was created. Here we can examine state of the game at any date or build revision number, which we set up here. Uh, if the data has been collected for that date revision, that is, but usually it was. And to get the data, we have written a set of data gathering commandlets that worked in editor and collected every piece of information that we were interested, mostly types of actors, components, volumes, levels, locations there, parameters, settings, and such. And all this data was stored, uh, stored and presented to end users on the website, which we did also, where they ca could easily inspect everything. They could like, sort it, hide by some parameters, tweak it, and generally speaking, no more. There is some other types, uh, types of data which can be gathered in editor. For example, FPS and memory, because those are obviously platform specific. So we have written a runtime automation system to collect it in release and test build configurations on all target platforms. We ended having quite a few modes here. Some widely used, others used only by specific group or person. And I'll show you a few of more helpful screens from the BFS, at least from my perspective, on the next few slides. For example, here you can see the low level memory screen. And the, it shows us PS4 memory statistics for the player standing in this position. Basically, you could click on anyone to see the picture like this. Red is loaded levels for this position. Uh, not so red is level loads. Uh, there you can see LRM stats, current PS4 build, last PS4 build, delta change, anything. We could set up this also to check for between different platforms. And we used runtime automation system to create this by basically teleporting our robot to every cell and gathering LRM stats there, send it to the web server, and here we are. If some cells were over budget, they would be painted blue instead of green. Right now they are all green, but believe me, there was a time where it was not the case, like this one, it's one of the earlier optimization screens. And a few hundred UDN posts and some work later, everything went okay. And also, we have this Yellow, it's always the, the heaviest cell in the game is marked by that, so you could easily spot your the most horrific OM place and investigate it. So this screen alone provided to be invaluable for optimization efforts. And we were able to make contact changes, code changes, and like look directly at what that gave or took us. Also, we kind of set up these stats budgets and were able to audit their usage and see what is happening between builds, what is added, what is removed, how does it influence the stats. This is our second per-platform optimization screen. This time it's keeping track of the FPS and it's taken on the test build configurations on PS4 and Xbox One. So, every morning or night, our automation system teleported to every crossroad of the city, looked at 12 directions over there, and gathered the start unit data. And then you could click on this red with bad FPS and see the start there in order to investigate, to make some calibrations by the card team and uh, to create tasks for artists to fix specific places. This is another Tecart screen, this time with an editor collected data, the light sources overview. 
as you all probably know, a badly set up light source can ruin anyone's day by killing FPS in some part of the scene, or maybe even everywhere if you set the radios correctly. <laughs> and here we have all our light sources, all their parameters, all their settings, they are color coded. And uh, frankly speaking, you can spot the violating light sources using this screen. You can like sort them if you want to see this, this or this, point light, spotlight, rectangular light, movable, stationary, static, whatever you want. Cast shadow, doesn't cast shadow. And using this, our tech art can really fix problems even before we have a ticket from our testers that the FPS is bad somewhere. He no longer needs to load a bunch of levels to investigate the problem. He just uses our web tools, he finds problems, he fixes this. Really saves some time. And the last of the more interesting screens I wanted to show you is the gameplay object screen. Here mission designers can expect and filter all their gameplay features, like, like here by, by quest, by feature type, by zone, it like it's, it has a big amount of settings over there. And they use it to inspect the gameplay density, to see which features with which settings were used, which were not so used, uh, where they are used and which game district on which game quest, etc. And fun fact, this screen was also used a lot by our artist team when they need to change some part of the city to modify it to know, like, is there a gameplay there? Who do they need to negotiate to change it? And they did. So to wrap up about our web tools. All in all, we have more than 30 different screens now with different data for us to look at. It was very helpful on both artistic and gameplay development of the game, as well as these screens were widely used by our quality assurance team. We also used them quite a lot during meetings on all levels to quickly get information on the stuff we were discussing to better decide it. So, our global conclusion is, we think that setting up proper content pipeline is really important in making an open world game. And this content pipeline, it should be flexible enough not to, like, you know, kill the creativity of everyone involved in that. But yet, it should give you some possibility to actually release everything that is created using those creativity. And the second takeaway would be that usually open world games are big, and that means that there are a lot of content in them. And we have created quite a few convenient tools for our content creator to create this content. And that really means that a lot more of this content is created really fast. And you really should be ready for that huge volumes of content, because we certainly were not enough ready. You should check your net infrastructure. You should check your developers' PCs, your CI systems, that they are all able to expand rapidly and usually unexpectedly when the need for that arises. Another takeaway is that knowing about what exactly is going on and what everyone is doing in your game is invaluable to do less and get more in the end. And you should probably invest some time in developing tools for doing that, as we did, because we think that our web tools, they were uh, really important in developing our game with that time frame that we had. And use UDN, because we used it quite a lot during our game development, and we always got the help that we needed first. Don't be shy to ask because we were not. Thank you, Epic Guys support, if you are here. <laughs> okay, thank you, all, everyone. Thank you for listening.